We're going to talk about a very hot topic indeed this morning, which is the role of medical marijuana and particularly cannabidiol, which is a component of medical marijuana in epilepsy. And I want to um, talk specifically on what do we really know and where are sort of our gaps of knowledge um, and what are sort of some of the future directions. What we'll talk about today is I'm going to give a very brief overview of just what is marijuana. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the biology. Um, I'll try not to get too basic science-y, um, but what is some of the biology of, of cannabis? Um, a history of actually the use of cannabis in, uh, in medicine in general. And then we'll talk about some of the newer studies of um, what we've learned thus far about use of medical marijuana in particularly epilepsy. Um, and what are sort of future steps and what's our sort of uh, political climate going forward. So refresher information. Um, so what is medical marijuana? The, um, the sort of, uh, you know, medical term is cannabis. And it's, this is a plant. It's grown uh, particularly in Asia. Um, and there's actually many different varieties of cannabis. For example, cannabis sativa is used to make rope and has, uh, it's been used for many, many, many years. Um, and it's known colloquially as pot, um, hash, uh, hemp, and marijuana, which is the term that a lot of us are using today. Um, but its use has been dated back for many, many centuries. Um, it was historically used uh, as uh, a in rituals, in religious ceremonies, um, but also for medicinal purposes. Um, and the, the recreational use really came in because of a, the component known as THC. Um, and this is the psychoactive component of marijuana. Um, and the reason um, that it uh, is, is considered the psychoactive component is because it changes behavior and it modulates your eating, it uh, can cause some anxiety, um, can change learning and memory. Um, and when you, you know, when someone is using recreational marijuana, typically it is high in this THC component, up to about 13% is uh, THC, though there are some plants that are even higher at 37%. Um, there are, but marijuana is not just THC, it actually is composed of more than 400 different chemical components. Um, and um, one of the most common components is this classification of cannabinoids. So THC is in this category of cannabinoids, but the another cannabinoid is uh, cannabidiol, which is CBD, and that's the component I really want to focus on. So CBD is the, so considered the non-psychoactive uh, component. So how do cannabinoids in general work? Well, um, it's thought that they work primarily through two different receptors. Um, the first is CBD, uh, CB2, which is primarily in the immune system. So um, there's been some research that canna uh, cannabidiols and cannabinoids can actually um, modulate the immune system, reduce inflammation, um, and that's through the CB2 receptor. CB1, which is the most abundant receptor in the, uh, in the brain for cannabinoids, is found in the hippocampus, the cortex, the cerebellum, basal ganglia, really throughout the brain. Um, and this is uh, the receptor that's involved with modulating electrical activity. Um, and this is the primary receptor that THC works through. Um, but in fact, our brain actually has endogenous cannabinoids. Um, so neurons can actually produce some endogenous cannabinoids, and that is the way through which they can modulate neuronal signaling. So, sort of touching a little bit more about THC and its uh, mechanism, it goes through the CB1 receptor and then it alters synaptic function. So this is how it changes the behavior, creates your quote unquote high, um, and that can also cause from a sort of a useful perspective, pain reduction, reduced spasticity, enhanced appetite. This is why it's been useful for things like chemotherapy patients um, because of these effects. But CBD is a little bit more complicated, and we have a much less of an understanding of how CBD works. So it actually seems to bind these two receptors, CB1 and CB2, with very low affinity, meaning it's not tightly binding to these um, very quickly or readily. Um, the uh, mechanism is therefore thought to be more diverse. It's thought to involve uh, the serotonergic system, GABAergic system, um, acetylcholine, and even some of the prostaglandins are probably involved. It also is thought to block sodium channels, which is why it was even thought about in syndromes like Dravet. 
Um, and uh, like I mentioned, it does have, potentially have some anti-inflammatory effects. So we still have a lot to learn there. But it actually, despite our, our gap of knowledge, medical cannabis has been used for a very long time. This is a, a, a timeline that you're not meant to read, but only to point out, <laughs> and it seems very small there, <laughs> that um, medical cannabis has been used for many years. So starting in 4000 BC, we see the first reports of medical cannabis. And it was used for a whole host of different uh, or problems, rheumatism, malaria, childbirth they used cannabis. Um, and then in um, 2700 BC, um, a Chinese emperor uh, sort of describes its, imp its important use in, in medical um, diseases. Um, and then um, in India, they were started using it much more in the first century. And that was where we see the first reports of its use in epilepsy. Um, and then in 1841, uh, a, a British physician who was visiting India observed um, its, its uses and then brought it back to sort of the, w the Western world, um, and that's where that spread occurred. But then in the early 20th century, um, we, there was a, a sort of pause in, in its use for medical purposes. Um, so this is when sort of, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the old film Reefer Madness, um, but um, there was this sort of push uh, uh, or a cultural change where there was a lot of concern about the use of, of marijuana. Um, and they um, started having uh, legal and um, legislative acts against marijuana. And at that time, actually, the American Medical Association opposed it. They said, we don't know marijuana. It's a largely unknown quantity, but it may have uses. Um, and I think the, the primary concern was about this THC component. So THC became... Um, an unacceptable uh, drug. Um, it was categorized as FDA category one. Um, and um, this is really what sort of took it off the table as a potential medical therapy. Um, in, there were a couple of select cases where people were able to obtain uh, medical marijuana. For example, in 1976, there was a big court battle in which um, uh, Robert Randall actually eventually got uh, an a, a investigational um, protocol in which he was able to use the medical marijuana to treat his glaucoma. Um, and then things started to change sort of in the mid-1990s. And this is where we started to see some people bringing this back to courts, particularly in California, um, there was some push to use medical marijuana for things like cancer, AIDS, um, and to treat muscle spasticity in particular. And then I think one of the biggest changes uh, came with um, Charlotte Figge and her story, and Sanjay Gupta uh, aired this big documentary, I don't probably many in this uh, room have seen it, um, called Weed, and that occurred in August 2013. And this really sort of uh, was a big change in how the medical world and, um, and um, many of the uh, uh, people who were um, largely treating epilepsy were thinking about the use of medical marijuana. And since then, CBD has gained some traction. Now, I'm, I, I put there specifically CBD, um, cannabidiol, um, because I think that's where some of the more evidence uh, exists as opposed to um, marijuana in general or THC, but we can, we'll talk about that more. <clears throat> so what do we know from our trials and from medical um, um, inquiry about uh, the use of medical marijuana in epilepsy? So like I mentioned, the general effects of cannabis that we know are um, these acute psychomotor effects. So it's known that they, they can cause distortion in your distance perception. Um, it can cause difficulty making rapid judgments, uh, slow reaction time, impair your tracking behavior, and slow time perception in general. These effects are thought to be dose related. <clears throat> And in fact, in the DSM-5, which is a, um, the psychiatry sort of Bible, so to speak, where they, um, where they record all sort of psychiatric illness and um, psychiatric uh, difficulties, they, they have a categorization of cannabis intoxication in which they record the primary effects of cannabis in general. And it's not without its health problems. I, I don't want to under, I do want to underscore this because I, I don't want to ignore the, 
um, potential effects of cannabis. So um, there are many, many uh, reports and clear evidence that um, cannabis can cause respiratory problems, chronic bronchitis, for example, um, uh, pharyngitis, lung cancer. There was some concern at some points, but that, that um, evidence hasn't really stood up that, it could, that it's associated with cannabis. Um, addiction is a problem. About 5 to 10 percent of adult users of cannabis can become addicts. Um, and there is some concern that that can be higher in children um, if you introduce it earlier. Um, motor vehicle accidents, there's concern because of the slowing of your, your reaction time, that, that, that this could uh, cause uh, more motor vehicle accidents. Um, we haven't seen that de to be uh, definitely true, um, unlike the alcohol case, but it's still a concern. And then there are definite concerns about memory, and especially with chronic use. Does that affect your ability to create new memories, to retain memories? Um, there have been two studies looking at the long-term cognitive impacts of cannabis use. What, these were really great studies because they were massive populations. So they looked at um, one study is from Cardia, which is uh, the coronary artery risk development in young adults study. So this was actually a cohort study where they took um, people that were born between 1985 and 1986, followed them through their life until they were about 18 years old. And then they were trying to figure out risk factors for coronary artery disease, so different issue. However, they gathered a lot of data looking for risk factors of coronary artery disease. And what they found was that in this population of uh, you know, all comers, 18-year-olds, 11% had long-term cannabis use, so it's pretty high. 84% um, of people said they had used marijuana at some point in the past. Um, and they did find that there was a decrease in verbal memory in those who had long-term ca uh, cannabis use, but no change in their executive functioning or processing speed. So this was different than what people were expecting. Um, there was a somewhat similar study done in New Zealand. In New Zealand, like many of the Scandinavian countries, they have really good um, sort of whole country nationalized um, uh, 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 health care um, collection databases, and so they took um, patients that, or people, I'm sorry, that were born um, and followed them for 38 years. So this was everyone that was born. They had over 1,000 patients that they followed uh, forward from this one, uh, this one city, which is uh, Dunedin. Um, and they uh, were able to do IQ studies on all these people. And what they found that those who were persistent users, um, which is, means at least a daily use, they had about a six IQ point difference. Um, there was also, they found some impairment in concentration, um, and they found that more persistent use, the more you used, you had more decline. Um, this study, some people have questioned because they haven't been able to replicate it, I, have, I should say. Um, there was also concerns about could cannabis use uh, be related to schizophrenia or psychosis. And this was found because in a large study, um, cannabis use was much higher in schizophrenic population. Um, but there's been concerns that this may be actually just um, that, that people with schizophrenia might be using cannabis to actually treat some of their symptoms. And so the causality has not been shown in those studies. Um, and then what about cannabidiol in particular? So this is that CBD component of medical cannabis. Um, well, the data for cannabidiol in general is far more limited because it's only been um, relatively recent that people isolated cannabidiol. Um, and so there's limited long-term safety data. Um, there's not any known um, central nervous system side effects. Um, and they actually have given people doses up to 600 milligrams without any major vital sign changes or concerns for <laughs> acute, uh, diff diff acute problems. Um, there's this three theoretical risk, as I mentioned, that it could actually suppress your immune system, um, which it, it go goes through these certain mechanisms of, of two different cytokines, interleukin-8 and 10. <clears throat> so now I'm going to move to the studies that have been done, particularly in cannabidiol. So um, oh, this, again, not meant to read that whole, <laughs> that whole, uh, that whole uh, graph, but the the, uh, this is meant to show you that prior to about two years ago, this was all the data we had on cannabidiol. And what that amounted to was, um, uh, this is from a, a review study that looked at all the literature that was published prior to 2014 on cannabidiol use in, um, in different medical conditions. 
And there were about um, 32 total studies. Most of them were in chronic pain. And really, overall, only 3,000 patients that have been studied in cannabidiol. So very, very small amounts of data. The promising data was really in pain and spasticity. Um, when we look specifically at the epilepsy uh, data, there were really only four studies prior to 2014 that looked at um, cannabidiol use in epilepsy. Um, and these were all incredibly sl small studies. You can see there the number of patients were 9, 15, 12, 12, so very small studies. So there was a real paucity of, of data and knowledge about what cannab cannabidiol does in epilepsy. So some of the first um, more recent studies that were done were actually done using social media. And this was uh, in large part due to advocacy groups like the Epilepsy Foundation where um, uh, parents were saying, hey, um, parents and, and adult patients as well were saying, hey, you know, this is something we've heard sort of rumor about, we've been hearing about a lot, we've been passing on information between each other, and um, would let their physicians know. And so there was um, one physician group uh, led by Brenda Porter who actually did a, a, a survey on a Facebook support group where these were friends of a marijuana, a medical marijuana. So these were, this was a self-selecting group of people who were already saying, hey, I support medical marijuana. Um, and they had them fill out a survey, um, and they gathered data from 20 different uh, parents, they had, which amounted to, they actually had 19 children in the end who were using CBD-enriched marijuana strain. 13 of those patients had Dravet. Um, four had Deuces syndrome, or myoclonic astatic ep epilepsy. And what they found was that 84% reported a reduction in seizure frequency. Two actually said that their child was seizure free. Um, and eight said that there was more than an 80% reduction in seizures. And then some of the other things that they reported was not only a change in their seizure frequency, but also improvements in their mood, alertness, um, and improvements in sleep. Um, but they did say that they were having some side effects, drowsiness and fatigue being the primary ones. There's a very similar study that then followed looking at particularly Lennox Gusteau patients and, um, and patients with infantile spasms. Um, and this was again just an online survey of patients who uh, were giving, already giving um, CBD enriched cannabis. So this is the cannabidiol component is um, enriched such as in Charlotte's Web. Um, and they looked particularly in the patients of these two subgroups. They found 117 pa parents who were willing to fill out the survey. Um, and they again found similar numbers. 85% of parents reported a reduction in seizure frequency. 14% reported a complete uh, seizure freedom. And they said that side effects were less common in CBD when they compared with their other medications that they were receiving. And again, they said improvements in sleep, alertness, mood. So this uh, really gained attention from um, not only physicians, but also um, from the pharmaceutical companies. And GW Pharma actually made a CBD, uh, a pure CBD pharmaceutical grade uh, medication. And then um, uh, they have just since done several different trials. Um, one of the first trials that was published was on this called expanded access trial, in which they uh, enrolled patients, um, a total of 200 patients, who all had refractory epilepsy, um, and these patients were followed for 12 weeks in which they got sort of a baseline of what their seizure frequency was. They then were given um, cannabidiol, um, which is this pharmaceutical grade, and they um, followed them again for 12 weeks and again counted seizures. And overall, um, so this is sort of the graphs of the efficacy, and you can see um, on the axis you have percent change in, um, uh, in monthly motor seizures. Um, and so they, they divided the seizures into either motor seizures or, or convulsive seizures or non-motor seizures, which um, probably if you go to Dr. DeLugos' um, workshop, he'll talk to you about how we categorize seizures in general. But um, uh, this was, they saw a clear reduction. And in fact, overall, they found 37% uh, reduction in all motor seizures. Um, a reduction in total seizures was about 34%. Um, when they looked at atonic seizures in particular, meaning these drop seizures, there was a 60% reduction. So that's pretty significant. Um, whereas you know, tonic-clonic seizures, there was only 18%. They also found that uh, close to 9% of patients were seizure-free at 12 weeks. So 12 weeks, 
Uh, many people here may have had experience with sort of this idea of a honeymoon period when you first start a medication. So 12 weeks is good, but it's not great. Um, uh, and then Dravet patients, they in particular seem to have uh, do better than the overall population. So 49% had more than 50% reduction in their seizure frequency. I will just give that with a caveat of counting seizures can be very difficult, particularly in patients who have seizures all the time and very frequent seizures. So, um, you know, but they were seeing reductions. They were adverse events as well. Um, the most common was somnolence, um, which was seen in about 25% of patients. They actually found decrease in appetite, because remember, CBD in some ways does uh, some of the opposite things as THC, so they found some decrease in appetite. Um, and there were some GI side effects as well. Those were um, some of the primary side effects noted. Um, we did a, a very small um, study which looked at um, just seven patients, but these were patients who had a, a very severe kind of epilepsy known as FIRES, or febrile <coughs> infection-related epilepsy syndrome, in which they were actually um, in essentially clinical status, and then we gave them um, cannabidiol. Um, these were patients that had already sort of exhausted uh, coma medications. Um, and we found um, in these seven patients um, that there was an improvement in seizure uh, frequency and duration. One patient unfortunately passed away, um, which was thought, was thought to be unrelated to the cannabidiol, um, but um, they were able to reduce the number of uh, anti-epileptics that they were on, and they had improvement in their outcomes. This is a group of patients that have very poor outcomes, but uh, at the end of the study, um, five were ambulatory and four were able to speak. <coughs> And then, um, very recently, um, th there was a, a big study that was published, um, led by Oren Davinsky um, up at NYU, um, again using this GW Pharma um, uh, CBD, um, in which they looked specifically at the Dravet population. And this, um, so this population, if you recall, um, had really good results on, in the open label study compared to the overall population. Um, and they gave uh, CBD um, to these patients, and um, it was actually a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. So they enrolled 120, it was children and young adults who had Dravet, um, and they um, had to be considered treatment resistant, and they either continued their standard ep anti-epileptics and got placebo, or they got the, continued the standard anti-epileptics and got the cannabidiol. And again, they looked for changes in convulsive seizure frequency in a 14-week period. Um, and this is the overall, um, the, the key characteristics of these patients. What I really just wanted to point out here was that many of them were on um, Clobazam, which we'll come back to, um, as well as Valproate. So they were on other anti-epileptics, um, which may have some interactions with cannabidiol. But um, they found, again, that about 5% of the CBD subject group became seizure-free, 0% um, in the placebo group. Um, and they also found a decrease in mean convulsion per week, so they went from 12 to 5, and um, there was a very slight reduction with the placebo group, which is typical in studies. Um, and they also found that um, when they looked at the percent of people who had at least a 50% reduction in their seizure frequency, it was about 43% with cannabidiol. <coughs> Um, again, there were some adverse events. Um, we see GI side effects was um, the biggest one, uh, as well as fatigue again coming in. Um, some of the other uh, effects, such as convulsions, it's hard to, it's, you know, these are things that they have to report. They did a, so there, um, there's a similar study ongoing for lennox gastaut syndrome, um, in which they uh, have screened 200 patients um, and they are again randomizing them to either getting placebo or CBD plus their known anti-epileptics. Um, and this is, um, this is information from a poster presentation that was done at AES, but um, the, um, the patient population was very similar. I would just want to point out that they do have some adults in this trial. So um, they have 30 patients in the CBD group who are between 18 and 55. 28 in the placebo group. Um, and again, we see that there it looks to be efficacy in the Lennox-Gastaut population. 
Um, so this is looking at total number of seizures during the treatment period, and then afterwards they actually were, were then enrolled in the open label study, or the open access study. Um, and so we see a, a clear reduction in seizures that was significant. Uh, and this is looking at when you actually ask patients, instead of just counting seizures, do you feel like you have, uh, your epilepsy is much improved, very improved, slightly improved, is sort of categorical. Um, and we see that again that people saw a significant improvement. Um, when they look specifically at these atonic or drop seizures, we see a much uh, even higher uh, rates of improvement. So reduction in drop seizures uh, was about 42% in those who were taking higher dose. So they actually staged the dosing. Um, these are done in milligrams per kilo because of the pediatric population. Um, but they, they saw a reduction at, at both doses, slightly higher with the higher dose. Again, there were adverse events, though. Um, so um, I, diarrhea and somnolence still hitting the top of the list. Um, decrease in appetite um, and vomiting were also there. And then when we look specifically at the adult population, unfortunately, there has not been any um, randomized uh, placebo-controlled trials. Um, so um, these are some these uh, studies are for particular epilepsy syndromes. Um, and uh, there are some adults included, but when we look at sort of all, all comers of adult population, there's actually only been four total trials identified. In a big um, Cochrane uh, database review, um, they were found to be, all be of pretty poor quality. Um, and, uh, but the, what we can gain from those four studies is that they were able to give 200 to 300 milligrams of cannabidiol um, safely um, to these patients. More recently, so this actually just came out a couple months ago, out of Australia. Um, they um, did, the Australian group did an, an online survey of just everyone who was, had epilepsy and how often were they using cannabis. Um, they found that 50% of adult epilepsy patients reported using cannabis, um, and 90% re reported a reduction in seizure frequency. So that's much higher than what any of the clinical trials are showing. Um, and this is just, again, a survey, um, but um, that's some of the more recent data on, sort of on the adult population in particular. Um, where do we stand, though, given this new data on actually having access to medical cannabis? Um, well, this is a, a, a graph that I think is great. I actually pulled it from the Epilepsy Foundation website, um, but it's uh, showing that each state has very different laws about this. Um, and, in fact, the national laws have not changed. So um, in the red, you can see where recreational cannabis is legal. Um, in yellow, it's where medical cannabis is legal. In Pennsylvania, uh, ranks among those. Um, in blue, you can see where cannabidiol in particular alone has been made legal. Uh, and gray is where there's no legal use at all. So Pennsylvania actually changed its policy with this Act 16 um, that just came out about a year ago. Um, and what they said was that um, patients who have a um, serious medical condition, which they categorize as any of the listed conditions above, um, can obtain uh, medical cannabis um, if they get a card. Um, they, so they have to apply and they have to get it from a certified um, distributor. Um, however, this is in contrast to um, federal law, which still categorizes marijuana as a Schedule I substance, um, meaning having medical cannabis is uh, completely illegal. Um, essentially, what has happened is that um, the, uh, the Department of Justice has said that they will defer the right to challenge states' legalization laws. So they have not changed the, uh, the federal law, but are sort of saying, okay, we're just kind of let, going to let states take the lead here. Um, so it's a little bit of a tricky issue, um, and has led to a lot of concerns about people, for example, bringing things across state lines, um, because now you are not under state jurisdiction. Um, and again, in, in 2016, you can now, um, have the uh, medical cannabis in Pennsylvania per our law, but the, we still need the setup to actually have dispensaries because you can't go to, say, New Jersey and bring, um, bring it across. Um, 
And in fact, the implementation of state medical marijuana programs is ongoing, but they say it will take about 18 to 24 months. Um, so we're still waiting for that. So what can we say overall? It seems like uh, cannabis contains compounds such as cannabidiol, which may have potential therapeutic applications. Um, but we don't fully understand how cannabidiol works. Um, there are some long-term health concerns that I don't want to minimize, um, including concerns about memory um, and cognitive factors that really may play more into sort of the adolescent, young adult population. Um, and uh, um, data does exist, though, for some health benefits, though we still need some better, stronger trials. Um, tr studies in general right now are still challenged by the, the uh, legal status of medical marijuana, um, but this seems to be changing, particularly as public perception is really changing. Some future issues that are um, going to come up are sort of where, where does this kind of where are we going to be uh, getting medical cannabis? Is this going to be pharmaceutical uh, jurisdiction, so are, sort of like the GW Pharma, versus are, are people going to continue to use things like Haley's Hope or Charlotte's Web from a nutraceutical um, uh, distributor? Um, are, we, are we going to try to use whole plant or sort of isolate particular components? Um, what patient populations should treatment be directed at? Um, do we have a, a, an ability to co collect um, all the side effects in a, in a good and efficient way? Um, and can we t what can we learn about long-term side effects? Um, because cannabis, medical cannabis, has been used recreationally um, for a long time, we do have some knowledge, but these are high THC component um, strains in general. Um, and then, again, we need better understanding of how, how medical cannabis interacts with the other medications we're using. Um, and what mechanisms it's using. So that brings me to this one sort of side point I just wanted to bring up. There has been some thought that one of the ways that CBD is working for epilepsy, particularly in the Lennox Gusteau and Dravet patients, is through um, its interaction with clobazam. So clobazam or onfi um, is commonly used in that patient population. Um, and it's actually metabolized through the liver. Um, and CBD inhibits some of the enzymes um, that are used to metabolize onfi. And so um, what we found is that patients who are on clobazam plus CBD have higher levels of the onfi once they start the CBD. Um, and so it may be that actually this effect, um, so this sort of relationship between the two is what creating some of the benefit. Um, and it's not only epilepsy that's sort of getting on board here. I, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, currently there's also ongoing studies in autism um, and social deficits in general. In the epilepsy field, um, there's ongoing studies in infantile spasms, the Lennox Gusteau, Sturge Weber syndrome, um, tuberous sclerosis, and then there's still some ongoing studies in pain and schizophrenia as well. Um, and people are talking about expanding studies to other issues. Um, uh, PTSD has been a, uh, an area that's gotten a lot of traction in particular. And I have to give a special thank you to Eric Marsh. Um, he has been a mentor to me and, and was involved um, in a, a lot of the GW Pharma CBD studies and actually let me borrow some of his slides, which is always great. So I, I want to thank him in particular. And I'll take any questions. <laughs> 